It's hard to imagine anyone but Wesley Snipes as the half-vampire, katana-wielding hero in Blade. But on the 20-year anniversary of the first movie of the trilogy, let's take a look at three actors who were about to be the Vampire Slayer. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up him. Red Hulk, aka the Ink Red a Bull Hulk, aka Rolk. Which is when we last saw him square off with Wolverine. Look, eventually, you're gonna hang up the claws, and it's gonna make a lot of people very sad. Huh? Let the dance of dragons begin. To all then, we run down the 20 years of palace intrigue covered in House of the Dragon Season 1 to explain what causes Season 2's all-out war between the Blacks, supporters of Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it! Then somebody should make a sequel. No, look at that, they are. Yeah! producers began developing Blade in 1992, the first star attached was someone who showed his fighting skills in his song, Mama Said Knock You Out, LL Cool J. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. Once the movie got set up at New Line with screenwriter David Goyer, they reportedly had other actors in mind and passed on LL Cool J. Wait till I tell Tupac about this. They started looking at the star of Crimson Tide, Oscar winner Denzel Washington. While he may not have been able to kill vampires, he was able to kill in Book of Eli, The Magnificent Seven, and The Equalizer. King Kong ain't got s on me! The studio also liked Lawrence Fishburne, who certainly showed his acting chops in Boys in the Hood, Apocalypse Now, and let's not forget, Pee Wee's Playhouse. But it worked out for Fishburne in the end because the year after Blade was released, he became Morpheus in the Matrix trilogy. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. He wasn't the one for Blade, though, in the eyes of Goyer, who has said he always envisioned Snipes in the role. The diverse actor, known for comedic roles in Major League and White Men Can't Jump and dramatic roles in New Jack City and Jungle Fever, had also proved he could demolish on the big screen too. Blade was a success among moviegoers and gained more than $130 million worldwide and spawned both Blade 2 and Blade Trinity. But has the vampire killer really hung up his blade? Oh, are you out of your damn mind? There are rumors of a reboot with the comic book character helping out the X-Men, teaming up with Spider-Man, and choosing Iron Man's side in Civil War, there is no telling where he might make his next appearance. I've always hated Disney films. Let the dance of dragons begin. To war then. We run down the 20 years of palace intrigue covered in House of the Dragon Season 1 to explain what causes Season 2's all-out war between the Blacks, supporters of Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen, and the Greens, defenders of Prince Aegon's claim to the Iron Throne. Heedless ambition has always been a Valyrian weakness. First, some table setting. Over 200 years before Game of Thrones, House Targaryen unites the Seven Kingdoms under the rule of King Viserys I. May the luck of the Seven shine upon all combatants! But without a male heir and afflicted by a wasting disease similar to leprosy, the Targaryen rule is in jeopardy. So Viserys angers essentially everyone by naming his daughter Rhaenyra as his successor. Everyone says Targaryens are closer to gods than to men. But they say that because of our dragons. Complicating matters further, the king marries Lady Allison, the daughter of his hand, Otto Hightower, and best buddy of his daughter, Rhaenyra, which really puts a strain on their friendship, and gets even worse when the happy couple have a pair of sons, Princes Aegon and Aemon, who should be next in line for the Iron Throne, except Viserys already told Rhaenyra that she could have it. This is the highest of treasons. And they aren't the only ones who want to sit on this all too stabby chair of swords, because Viserys has a brother with zero chill named Daemon, aka the Rogue Prince, and they have a cousin, Princess Rhaenys, aka the Queen Who Never Was, and they both make moves for the Iron Throne before later accepting that Rhaenyra's rule would be much preferred over that of petulant tyrant Prince Aegon. Do you love me? You imbecile. Despite being her uncle, not that that has ever stopped anyone in the Game of Thrones averse, Daemon marries Rhaenyra to combine their powers, and Rhaenys ruins King Aegon's coronation by riding her dragon through the crowd. <laughs> 
but it's the deadly airborne dragon fight between Prince Aemon and Rhaenyra's second-born son, Lucerys, that is the final straw for the bloody Targaryen civil war to start between the forces of Alicent and Rhaenyra. Let the self-aggrandizing begin. Deadpool's threequel is set to rock the very foundation of the Marvel Cinematic Universe by ushering in our old pals, the X-Men. But will it be the mutants of the movies, or are we about to meet a live-action Wolverine, Beast, Cyclops, and Jean Grey from the 1990s X-Men animated series? Are the animated X-Men in Deadpool and Wolverine? Just get me out of here. Marvel's Deadpool and Wolverine pits Ryan Reynolds' Merc with the Mouth against the Time Variance Authority, the multiverse pruning agency from the Disney Plus series, Loki. I see. And then what do you do? Dictate the proper flow of time according to their dictations. How do you plead? Guilty. TVA agent Paradox, played by Succession's Matthew McFadden, has likely taken notice of Wade Wilson's timeline tomfoolery at the end of 2018's Deadpool 2, which is when we last saw him square off with Wolverine. Look, eventually you're going to hang up the claws and it's going to make a lot of people very sad. Huh? Hugh Jackman retired from playing the role after 2017's Logan, but he's back in the trademark yellow and blue spandex from the comic books and from X-Men, the animated series which ran from 92 to 97 and just so happens to be making a comeback to Disney Plus as X-Men 97. Apparently, I've returned just in time. Maybe it's convenient timing, or maybe the TVA sent Deadpool to a timeless void where Wolverine has been biding his time, waiting to be resurrected in this new Disney Plus series that picks up right where the original show left off. The X-Men mourning the loss of their leader, Charles Xavier, as supervillain Magneto threatens to initiate an all-out assault on mankind. Magneto, the last will and testament of Charles Xavier. Everything he built now belongs to me. The MCU relaunching these versions of the X-Men could explain why that surprise Beast cameo in the Marvels didn't look like the Kelsey Grammer version of Hank McCoy from X-Men The Last Stand, but instead resembled Beast from the cartoon. My theory? You somehow crossed through a tear in space-time. Or why Patrick Stewart's Professor X glided into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness in his yellow hover chair from the animated series instead of the X-laden wheelchair from the films. What do they call you? Wheels? This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Deadpool and Wolverine's Super Bowl teaser has plenty of Easter eggs to throw us off this cartoonish trail, including glimpses of the Secret Wars comic book series with Doctor Doom and a look-alike for the evil, metal-headed arch-nemesis of the Fantastic Four. But don't be fooled. This is a mutant misadventure through forgotten timelines including Jennifer Garner's Elektra and Sabretooth Pyro and Toad's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants from X2. Meanwhile, Mr. Fantastic's Fortet will get their chance to shine in their own 2025 film. The Lord works in mysterious ways, don't I? A good day. Red Hulk, aka the Ink red a Hulk, aka Rolk. You know what? We'll just go with Red Hulk. So, where does the MCU's new crimson creature come from? Why is he tangling with Captain America in Brave New World? And would we like him when he's angry? I have to admit, I'm still getting used to the new look. Despite Harrison Ford feigning ignorance in interviews, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross clearly transforms into the Red Hulk in the fourth Captain America film, as his character has been doing so in the comic books since 2008, when Ross finally snapped and got dosed with gamma radiation in his Captain Ahab-esque pursuit to destroy the regular Hulk, aka Bruce Banner, for being a nerd, time travel, and dating his daughter, Betty Ross. Betty Ross, who will once again be played by Liv Tyler after she's been absent from the MCU since 2008's The Incredible Hulk, also gets gamified in the comics and mutates into Red She-Hulk. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Look at me. Look at me. You have to go far away from me as you can. Don't argue with me. Just go. Go! With no Bruce Banner, Mark Ruffalo, or Green Hulk in sight, 
Brave New World will likely flip the script on the why and the how of Thunderbolt Ross's transformation into the Red Hulk, as it seems the new president does so to protect himself from a glowing global threat. You may be Captain America, but you're not Steve Rogers. Right. I'm not. Does that mean Captain America is a threat to America? Probably not, because the problem with a Hulk is they always go out of control and end up smashing way more than you originally want them to. <laughs> Anthony Mackie's Sam Wilson, the latest red, white, and blue shield wielder, is more likely stuck in a battle between the Red Hulk, a mysterious marauder played by Giancarlo Esposito, and Tim Blake Nelson's Samuel Stearns. Another incredible Hulk blast from the past, who now goes by the leader because of his supersized smarts in his supersized brain. So we know our old pal Bruce Banner insists that we wouldn't like him when he's angry, because it's his rage that morphs him into the almost invincible Green Hulk. But is the same true for Thunderbolt Ross's Red Hulk? Not exactly. Instead, anger causes the Red Hulk's temperature to increase, like an NBA Jam player on an unstoppable streak. He's heating up! If Red Hulk gets too hot, he starts to weaken, which could be the Achilles heel that this new-ish cap needs to tame him. At least enough for Ross to chill out and gather up his eponymous team of reformed supervillains known as the Thunderbolts. But that's for another movie and for another IMDb Explains. We'll show the world a better way forward. This is all about Beetlejuice 2. You like it? Okay, we said it once. If we don't say his name two more times, we should be fine. So Michael Keaton is back as Beat. Believe it or not, the titular character of Tim Burton's 1988 horror comedy classic. Beetlejuice? Yes, that's it! We didn't say that one, so it doesn't count. Anyway, Winona Ryder and Catherine O'Hara are also back as mother and daughter Lydia and Delia Dietz, and Scream star Jenna Ortega plays Lydia's daughter. So let's play family just for tonight, hmm? Ortega and director Tim Burton recently collaborated on Netflix series Wednesday, which was created by Alfred Goff and Miles Miller, who also wrote the sequel script. It's like one big happy family reunion. You guys are making me nauseous. Not in a good way. New to this cast are Justin Thoreau in an unknown role, Willem Dafoe as an afterlife cop, and Monica Bellucci as the wife of Keaton's character. Hey, these aren't my roles. Come to think of it, I don't have any rules. Burton has been planning the sequel since 1990, originally titling it Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. <laughs> Nobody says the B word. <sighs> we had to say it. His name is in the title. Okay, one left. Burton believed mixing horror with the tropical setting would make for comedy gold, even having his ghost with the most win a surf contest to save the day. But that project could never hang 10. I don't want to do business with you deadbeats anyway. Thank you. Okay. That's it, we made it to the end, so all that's left to say is Beetlejuice. It's showtime.